what I hope to do today is get into the topic of vector functions. Uh, what this will deal with are functions that change as time goes on or some parameter. And we'll find that that's not too tough, but of course you have to represent things in terms of three-dimensional pictures. And what I'd like to do is go back and review a couple more problems in the basic three uh, coordinate systems that we've talked about. Cartesian, of course, a long time ago, but we just cooked up these two new systems called cylindrical and spherical. And I'd like to do a couple more problems where you exchange one system's coordinates for another. This is uh, problem 5B on page 673. And I believe we're given spherical coordinates two, five pi over six, and pi over four. Now in terms of what you're given, your book seems to have this as the order in which things appear. Theta is your old cylindrical theta, phi is a new angle, and rho is a new distance. And what I'd like to do is be able to fill in what this is in terms of uh, cylindrical and also Cartesian or rectangular. Now, to begin with, this theta up here is exactly the same as the theta in the cylindrical coordinates. That would be pi over 4. Let me show you what's coming up here. This will be r, this will be theta, and this will be your z, your Cartesian z. And then down here, it's your familiar x, y, and z down here. So as we fill these in, we can do a couple of problems all at once. Let me come over and do something, again, in general, just to refresh your memory rather quickly so we can see what we're after. Here you are at the origin. There's your Cartesian coordinate, rectangular Cartesian coordinate system. And the, the question was, how do you get to a point P hanging out here in free space? Well, there were three ways to do it. In terms of Cartesian coordinates, we just talked about that. That would have us come, let's say, down the x-axis a certain distance, parallel to the y-axis a certain distance, and then <coughs> parallel to the z-axis a certain distance. Those distances are given in terms of x, y, and z, positive or negative. Then we threw in the polar coordinate system as another way to get around in the xy plane. That is, we can come over here to P prime in terms of polar coordinates through an angle theta with respect to the positive x-axis and a distance which is either positive or negative from the origin. So that gets us from the origin out to P prime, and then we still go a distance z parallel to the z-axis. And then the last thing we talked about was the new spherical coordinate system, which is pretty much new. That is, the point P was given in terms of theta again, an angle phi with respect to the z-axis, positive z-axis. And by the way, we traditionally take phi between 0 and pi, in radians anyway just to keep uh, things simple, I suppose. Theta, of course, can be any positive or negative value as it was with polar coordinates. And then we also talk about a distance rho from the origin out to the point P. So the instructions would be perhaps uh, stand at the origin, make an angle theta with respect to the positive x-axis, look straight up, make an angle phi with respect to the positive z-axis, and then march out rho units directly towards p, and that would be the spherical coordinate. So that's what I was talking about over there. Either p is going to be in Cartesian coordinates, x, y, z, or in our polar coordinates with z thrown in called cylindrical coordinates, or rho, phi, theta in spherical coordinates. The thrust of the situation, though, is that in certain circumstances, in particular if you have cylinders, the problem might be easily handled in cylindrical coordinates, spheres, 
possibly spiritual coordinates would be uh, worth the effort. So let's see how they relate in this particular problem over here. Here we have given the new coordinate system, spherical coordinates for our point. Let's see if we can analyze what that looks like. Well, first, the point is two units straight line from the origin somewhere. It's projection onto the xy plane makes an angle of pi over 4 with a positive x-axis. That's a little theta. And its angle with respect to the positive z-axis is 5 pi over 6. Let's use the theta first. That's probably the more familiar. That says if you come out on the line, theta equals pi over 4. Somewhere out here is the projection of p. Let's call it p prime, as we had in that picture over there. Where is p prime? in the plane, P itself makes an angle of 5 pi over 6 with respect to the positive z-axis. So here's, well, 3 pi over 6. You continue on around, and you have a phi that's actually almost pi itself, 5 pi over 6. So what we're looking for is a point that's actually down here below the xy plane, and rho being 2 says that there are two units from the origin out to the point straight line distance. Well, that's pretty tough to analyze looking at it that way. Let's sketch out this all-important triangle right here and analyze it according to what we have in our general scheme over here. Let's see what that general scheme was. Let's take this picture right here that had the distance to P, radial distance, and Z distance. So I've taken this picture, and I want to look at it on edge so that you get a better feeling that this is a right angle right down here. Of course, it's the right angle that allows us to reconstruct a lot of the information. Now, with respect to the positive z-axis, here's our angle phi. And what I did just to make life simpler before was to reproduce phi up here using your old high school plane geometry. And by being doing that, I can then establish what these other values are. For example, in terms of rho, r is rho sine phi, and z is rho cosine phi. And that turns out to be a, probably a pair of critical relationships for most of these kinds of problems that we have over here if we want to make those conversions. So z is rho cosine phi, r is rho sine phi. Now let's take a look at the picture in this specific situation. In fact, let's get rid of the x-axis here for a moment. Something like that. And Z, here's our fee this time. And what we would be interested in, for example, in terms of rho anyway, are the other two sides. This would be the r that we're after, and this would be the z that we were after. That'd give us some information anyway. Well, once again, as we said over there, uh, z is rho cosine phi, r is rho sine phi. If you can remember that, then of course you can just hit the right keys in your calculator and you've got all the values that you need. But let's just step back and say maybe we don't know that. Uh, if this is 5 pi over 6, in terms of this triangle right here, that makes this angle what? Be pi over 6 or pi over 3, right? So that's a 60-degree angle right there. And, of course, this would be a 30-degree down here. And I think you'll find this the case in a lot of your problems. Famous angles pop up pretty regularly. Now, we knew what rho was because we were given the spherical coordinates. That equals 2. 
so we can replace these others pretty easily. Uh, this is the side opposite. In fact, if that's two, this is a one, two, square root of three triangle. Makes it that easy. Now, R is positive, one, two, but the square root of three, you have to put a negative sign in front of, obviously. I mean, if you've drawn your picture properly, you know that Z has to be negative because your point's below the XY plane. The other thing to remember is that if we did use your calculator buttons, it would all work out properly. This would be, in fact, 2 sine 5 pi over 6, as we had over there. And if you checked your calculator, this would be, do we have that right? Yes, and this would be uh, 2 cosine phi of 5 pi over 6. I'm just thinking in my head, if the signs are right, uh, phi is going to be between 0 and pi, in which case r will be positive. But z can either be positive or negative, depending on whether it's between 0 and pi over 2 or pi over 2 and pi. So that seems to work out properly. OK, and what I'm suggesting, I think, at least seems to be necessary for me sometimes, is to perhaps sketch the three-dimensional picture, but more importantly, sketch the two-dimensional triangle that gives you a couple of those values that you need. So what do we have? We have, for cylindrical, we now have R as 1, and we also have Z. So we're all done with cylindrical coordinates. That seems to be that story right there. And in terms of X, Y's, and Z's, we aren't quite done. Coming back to the original picture, uh, I think we can do this without any great effort. Maybe we can't. Let's, uh, let's take a look at it in terms of the xy plane, though. Here's p prime. What we know is that theta is pi over 4. We also just figured out what r is. That's equal to 1. So if you take your projections, for example, this is x is r cosine theta, 1 cosine pi over 4 if you use your calculator, should be what, uh, square root of 2 over 2? And in this particular case, of course, y would have the same value. So we can put those down and finish out our problem that way. Okay, looking back, I would say if you can keep your wits about you and your keys touching the right calculator keys, you'd be in great shape. You probably could get away without drawing this picture at all and just sit there and say, oh, well, let's see, z is equal to this, uh, rho cosine phi, plug in the numbers, uh, r is equal to rho sine phi, plug in the numbers, etc. x is uh, rho uh, cosine phi, cosine theta, things like that. In fact, I think I said that wrong. x is rho supposed to get uh, the, uh, the r value out, rho sine phi, cosine theta, etc. So one can go all the way from the original set to the Cartesian coordinates if you happen to remember these kinds of relationships here. Sometimes it's tough going the other way. In particular, if you have to use inverse trig functions, you're going to find it really gets mucked up because you're never too sure which inverse trig function you're supposed to use. You may not be in the right uh, coordinate system. Any questions? Let's, uh, one more time. I don't know. Maybe next time if you have a question or not, we'll throw another one at you just to keep your, your interest up. But I can only do about one of these a day, so I think I'll call it quits here. Okay. Well, let's push on. Let's do a little bit more of the newer material. That's over in Chapter 15. And what we'll first talk about are vector-valued functions. I think it's kind of nice if you start with something you've seen before. So let me review 
not any detail, something from your Calc 1 course. A kind of a different little uh, introduction because I don't think you've probably done it this way, and that is that you've taken something called an x-axis, which is the real numbers, and you've considered functions that map x-axis onto something called a y-axis. What you're really doing, of course, using your fancy books notation, is mapping a real number line either onto itself or a copy of it. This is the way your book would have it represented. You're mapping a one-dimensional space into a one-dimensional space. Sometimes it's indicated by saying, well, if this is the point x0, then this mapping, this function that you talked about, f, literally moves x0 over to y0 in some fashion, some formula. Every time you use your calculator, while we're on that subject, that's what you do. You put a number in the display, punch the f function button, and out comes some other number according to some prescribed rule. Well, you talked a little bit about functions in Calc 1. You also talked about limits. You wrote things like uh, limit of f as x goes to x0. This isn't really too formal, but that symbol right there stands for what f of x gets near as x approaches x0. Remember, your teacher never let you allow x to be x0. You only let it uh, get kind of close, as close as you wish. So we talked about limits. We talked about derivatives. Now, derivatives use the notion of limits. You take what you call the limit of a difference quotient, uh, f prime of x0 is the rate of change of y <coughs> at x equals x0. We talked about rates of change, and that got us into things like related rate problems, velocity, acceleration, things of that nature. Early on, that's what you did with what you call real valued functions of a real variable. Looking ahead a bit, past this semester, what you will do next semester is talk about real valued functions of more than one real variable. <coughs> the idea is you plug in a couple of numbers and your function f yields a third one. The difference would be that over here the domain would be something in the plane. You plug in a point, that is something with two coordinates, and out comes a number over here. And if you got into advanced calculus, if you happen to be a math major, you might map a plane to a plane. A pair of coordinates yields another pair of coordinates over here. And as you move this point around, this point over here moves around in some configuration. You can map three space to three space and, and go from there. Well, we're not going to do quite that, but it's going to be actually pretty close. Let me give you the idea of what a function is in general. Let's say if you were a math major, someday you might see it this way. You might have your domain somewhere in space x, your range over here in space y, and some point x0 gets mapped by f to some point <coughs> y0. Now all I've done here is uh, disassociate ourselves with straight lines or real numbers. We don't really have to have that anymore. In fact, you might have something called the alpha function. where you plug in a mid and out comes an alpha number. For example, Miss Miller here. What do we get out of that? 
eight, seven, four, nine, four, four. There we go. So there's an example of our alpha function. Of course, in this particular case, your domain is uh, some subset of the population of the world, I guess the brigade, and you plug in a member of the brigade, out comes a number. So it's no longer a number and a number, but something uh, different, of course, a person and a number over here. Uh, thinking ahead about uh, summer leave, you might plug in a mid and get a hometown. Plainville, Massachusetts. Okay, that can happen. So I know you could represent a hometown by a zip code or something, but nonetheless, I'm trying to get you away from saying that a function has to have a real number planted in here and out comes a real number over here. Basically, a function is just a relationship that satisfies certain properties. I guess basically the property of interest is if you put a mid in over here, you don't get two hometowns, at least simultaneously. Okay, so in a specific time frame, for everything you put in here, you get exactly one thing over here. Well, that's a bit too general, but that's kind of the thing I was talking about over here. Functions are more than you probably think. And what we're going to do in that direction is take, pretty much consistently anyway, a real number axis. We're going to call it t. And we're going to map a number t not into another number, but into a vector. Now let's just call this <coughs> r, I think, is what your book likes to call it. And this could be in three space. Let me throw in your third component free of charge. So for each, usually time, t, you get a specified vector over here, r of t. I don't think you see it yet, but the idea is that, for example, as time goes on, the tip of the vector, r of t, moves around in some pre-described uh, formulated fashion. If you like, you consider this to be the place of a fly flying around in the room. So the path of the fly would be indicated by the tip of the vector's path. Of course, there's more than just the path. It's where the fly is at a specified time, specifically pointing out where that fly is. Now, we just talked about coordinate systems. For the most part, we'll be dealing with the Cartesian coordinate system, but you could do this in cylindrical coordinates. If your fly likes to go around on cylinders, that's a possibility. If it flies around on spheres, maybe that would be advantageous. Well, as long as you're talking about flies, you might be interested not only where the fly is, but how far it flies over a specified time length. That would be the length of the curve. We'll talk about that. How fast and what direction it's going, the velocity vector, what its acceleration is, et cetera. Actually, there are a lot of questions about flies people don't know too much about. You ever think about it, what happens to a fly when it's hanging onto the ceiling and it takes off? Just how does it get into whatever path it's going to follow? I don't think we'll consider that, but that give you something to think about. Okay, what we will do, I mean, does it do an outside barrel roll? Think about it. That's pretty tough for a fly. What we'll do is we'll assume that this function, okay, I'm going to use it as a special notation. Got to put an arrow over it now. This vector valued function does have this kind of a representation. I can break it down into the three-dimensional coordinate system, component system, in terms of the i, j, and k vectors. So we'll assume that r looks like that. And if it's not specified, that would be for all t, but traditionally some of your problems like to say for t between a and b. Okay. Your problems look just about the same as that. That is, you put in a value of t, and you find out where the fly is at that value of t anyway. Later on, we'll talk about things that we did back in Calc 1 with respect to that vector function. We'll talk about limits, derivatives of vector-valued functions, a few notions like that. Okay, let's start doing a few of the problems that look like the ones you have. We'll start out with an easy one. 
at least one we can draw pretty well. <coughs> right out of your homework, this is page 679, and we'll look at problem three. Well, the function you're given actually has only two non-zero parts to it. The third one doesn't appear, and so you can, if you wish, slip in a zero k to indicate that there is no motion either up or down. So your fly is actually flying around in the xy plane. The question is, what path does it follow? I think in this problem, it's specified that t lies between minus and plus 2. Right now, about all you're asked to do is to graph the path and also find out how far the fly travels. See if there's anything exciting going on here. Well, as a typical graph problem, I would suggest that you just make up a table. Uh, there are a few tricks I might point out as we go along, but right now I think just a matter of uh, plotting against t what this r vector looks like. Now, since you're constrained to this interval, let's start out with integer numbers. It's easy enough to do anyway. We'll start out with a, a table that looks something like this, t, x, and y. There is no z. It's going to be 0 all the time. There is no z component, so to speak. But of course, what sits up here, what I called f of t, is going to be the x component for my vector. So I'll just simplify that as an x. Same thing here, that g of t will be my y component, and I'll just label that as y. So let's see what happens here. We'll go from minus 2 to plus 2 in integer steps like that. We'll have five points at least. See how it goes. Okay, computationally, no problem. t cubed is a negative 8. Gives me a not minus 9 for x. Let's just do the x column, in fact. A minus 1 gives me a minus 2 for x. 0 is a minus 1. Plus 1 is 0. And plus 2 gives me a 7. So those are the x coordinates for my five points. <coughs> and the y coordinates are t squared plus 2, so I get 4 plus 2 is 6, uh, 1 plus 2 is 3, 0 plus 2 is 2, 1 plus 2 is 3, and 4 plus 2 is 6 again. Now since my last component is always 0, we'll forget that third direction and just limit ourselves to drawing things in a plane, obviously. It's a simple, simple problem out of it. Okay, first off, t equals minus 2, x is minus 9. Okay, we're going from minus 9 to plus 7. Gives you some idea of what the numbers look like. It's always going to be above the x-axis, so I should have not even drawn a picture starting out like that. I guess I should have dropped this down a bit. Uh, like this, let's say. So out here at minus 9 units, kind of make that one up, we're 6 units up in the y direction. Say it's about minus 5 there, I guess. So the first point we have corresponds to t equals minus 2. There's where the fly starts. t equals minus 2. Let's see, we're at minus 2 and 3. About right here. That's at t equals minus 1. When t equals 0, we're at uh, minus 1 and 2. Okay, 
say t equals 1, we're over here at uh, 0 and 3. And uh, lastly, t equals 2 puts us at 7 and 6. I don't know that that's enough information. <laughs> I wouldn't say that it is. I'd, in fact, if I had a little bit more time and space, I'd put in some more points. But uh, I cheated. This is an odd numbered problem. So I looked in the back, and sure enough, they've got the little picture sketch there. So if you throw in more points, you can figure out a little bit better what's going on. But let's say I didn't uh, actually have that. What you might notice, and I, this isn't really presented to you in the book, is that if you have x as a function of t, and y is a function of t. This is irrespective of this particular topic right now. This, in fact, goes back to Calc 1, the famous uh, chain rule for derivatives. If you have x and y as functions of time, from that you can get, for example, dy dx as the change of g with respect to t over the change of f with respect to t. That's the chain rule. x is a function of t, y is a function of t. You can find the y dx in the xy plane as this particular quantity right here. Now, it doesn't look so good in that form. Let me write it in the way I remember it. This is dy dt, Leibniz notation, over dx dt. And what's nice about Leibniz notation is that it kind of helps you out here. If you cancel the differentials dt, sure enough, you get dy over dx. So perhaps you saw the chain rule in that form. If not, it really is the old chain rule that you saw. And let's go back and say, well, in this particular case, my function f of t for x was t cubed minus 1. Okay, So I put that derivative in the denominator, derivative of t cubed minus 1. And the numerator was t squared plus 1. Put that in right here t squared plus 2, pardon me. So I'm going to take the derivative of that. And let's come on back and say, well, derivative of t squared plus 2 with respect to t is 2t. So we get 2t over denominator 3t squared, or in other words, 2 over 3t. The reason I circled back is that I want to get back to what I was talking about, and that is the dy dx derivative is 2 over 3t. Uh, that's interesting because, of course, dy dx is the slope of my curve. Now, it's not the slope in terms of x and y coordinates. It's slope with respect to time. So here comes my fly at t equals minus 2. I know the slope to be about uh, minus a third, <coughs> which means for, uh, let's see, like this, m equals 2 over 3 times a minus 2, so that gives us a minus 1 third um, for every unit we come in the x direction. What is it? We drop 3 units in the y direction. Okay. Now, that's interesting. We could throw in some slopes, but what I wanted to key on was this point right here at t equals 0 the slope is, in fact, infinite or undefined. And that would help you not only draw perhaps the curve through these points with known slopes, but also point out that this is a bad point on the curve. It has a, well, according to this anyway, it has a vertical asymptote, a, a non-defined derivative. So again, if you look in the back of the book, there's a reason for us being able to do something like this, putting a corner on the function not just because you throw in a zillion points and that's the way it works out, but you can analyze it with some of these other facts that we've come across before. So it actually is a curve with a rather interesting little stop and start again. Looks like our fly bounced off something, uh, at least at t equals 0. Or if you come off the ceiling, sometimes that happens. Take their word for it. Okay, let's do uh, 
an easy one in three space. We'll come back and do a couple more next time too. This one I guess I just made up. This one has all three components there. It'll give us a taste of three-dimensional vector drawing again. Time from zero to three. Okay, let's do the, the same old thing, that is cook up a table. It's always safe. And let's just do it as we go down the time scale. T equals zero, X is gonna be three, Y will be zero, Z will be zero. Time one, x will be two, y will be one, and z will be two. Time two, three minus two is one, y will equal two, or t, and z is two t, or four. And lastly, three for t gives us zero for x, three for y, and six for z. So reading across, you have the coordinates of the point or the coordinates of the endpoint for our vector or actually the components. Of course, what I'm saying, for example, right here is that my vector valued function at one has components two, one, and two. So when we read off of a table now, we're actually looking off the components of the vector in question. I'm going to try something a little bit different here. Someone reminded me of it, and that is that some books tend to draw pictures in a different fashion. So here comes our z-axis, but just to make life a little bit more interesting, let's put x off here on our right, y back off there on our left, and z up and down like that. So we're actually looking from above and behind the z-axis down into that first quadrant of the xy plane. Several books do it this way. In fact, I suggested that plotting routine in a computer, 3D plot triple star, very often when you have a surface, you're going to want to reorient yourself to see that surface a little bit better. So let's take this time by time. 300 zero zero means we're out here three units along the x-axis. I didn't do it in this problem back here. I should have. I guess I just plain forgot it. It's kind of a mess anyway. But uh, let's do it. Rather than plot points, I should have been trying to impress upon you the fact that we're really plotting a vector. Here is r at 2. At t equals 2, the components of r were 7 and 6. In other words, this was 7i plus 6j. And I didn't give you the whole story back here. You're supposed to imagine that here's the fly, its position vector from origin to this point is where it exists. And then as time goes on, the vector shrinks, changes direction, and then expands out again. And here we have a snapshot of it at that instant, t equals 2. So the idea I should have gotten across was that a vector function has a change in magnitude and direction as time goes on, perhaps in some nice continuous fashion as you see here. So that's what I'll try to do over here in three space. Actually, our first vector looks like this. Here's r at t equals zero. The next r at t equals one has coordinates two, one, and two. So we go out two units this way, one unit this way, and up two units this way. I don't know I'll get all that on our board, so I better scale down a bit. There's R at one unit. At two units, it's one, two, four. And finally, at three time units, it's zero. 
3 and 6. Now, I'm fudging again. I'll tell you why in a second. But uh, let's say that's a, a wise choice of points right there. The reason I'm fudging is I already knew what this was even before I started plotting this out. Remember, we're saying that x is a function of time, in this case, 3 minus t. y is a function of time, in this case, t itself. And z is a function of time, is also a linear function in t. And you shouldn't be surprised. I guess it was just a week ago. We, s we talked about equations of lines in, in three space, and that's exactly what we have x is 3 plus or minus 1t, y is 0 plus 1t, and z is 0 plus 2t. In fact, you should look at that and say, well, that passes through this point here, which we knew, 3, 0, 0, and it had this as its direction vector. So what I've done is shown you that, in fact, lines as paths can be more interesting because, in effect, they can represent a time displacement of a particle. I haven't done such a great job, but that was supposed to pass through all four of those lines. You see, after the fly is gone, sure, it's interesting that the fly happened to pass through a straight line, left a contrail, let's say, straight line sitting in the room when you walk in. But even more interesting is exactly how it flew that path. Time zero, it was here, one here, two here, three here. In other words, it wasn't doing anything interesting in this particular case, but it could have been this fly came along, stopped for lunch, maybe backed up, forgot something, came back this way. It can do all kinds of interesting things and have the same path. So there's more than a path here meeting the eye. There's actually information as to how that path was done. In particular, we can then talk about how fast the fly was traveling at any time, what direction, acceleration, curvature, all kinds of neat things. So next time, we'll uh, add some of those neat things on. By the time we get done with this chapter, supposedly we can do the uh, derivation of Kepler's laws from Newtonian mechanics. I'm not sure we'll be ready for it, but uh, we'll see how it comes up. Thanks for sticking around. We'll see you.